Good afternoon, Derek Hogan here with North Georgia Technical College. I am working on a little video here for Product Machinists that I think will be rather interesting. You may look at this and go, what in the world are we looking at here? Well, this is one of those situations, just like in a previous video, I said, you have to learn when to say no. Well, I didn't say no to something that I should have. Um, what I have here is a shaft, a shaft for a tractor. The splines are cut in it to a certain point. They need to actually go back to here, to this area right here. Well, as you can see, they're not the back of the point. Got a couple of choices. I can mill them in. That'd be great. Now the shaft's Rockwell 57. So see, which means there is no way I'm gonna be able to mill this in. So I'm gonna grind it. So what we have here is we pulled out all the stops of our creative juices here. We have a dividing head. The dividing head basically is holding the shaft over here in the three jaw chuck on this side. Now, we're having to run it because of trying to get it on the grinder, get everything to fit on the grinder, we had to run it out the back of it. So that's gonna create a situation where we got a pretty good bit of unsupported material, which is why we have a foot stock here. Some of the nice things about being an old program that's been around for a long time is we got some kind of unique stuff like this. You know, this is a really neat old dividing head. Now, I needed the dividing head that could do four degrees. I'm gonna explain this in a second. Didn't have one that worked for me, so I made myself one. Took our 3D printer and I printed my own dividing head. Um, number plate here. I have 18, 27, 36, 45, and 54 holes. And they all allow me to do some level of degrees or degrees in minutes in that regard. So to catch up on where we're at with this, I had to take, we had to indicate this in this way right here, which we've done, which involved bumping it around. We had to indicate it in this way right here, which we've done. Now comes the fun part. I've got to figure out how I want to dress this. I got a couple of choices, one choice. And I very well may try both choices in this situation because of the fact this is not really an easy thing to do. One choice, remove this nut right here, take the puller, put it in here and pull the whole hub off. Take it over to another machine and I form dress it. That's not a bad option. I can make that work. Another option I've got, since I have a pretty rigid setup here, is I could crush dress this. That's what I'm gonna try first and see if I can actually crush dress this and get it to actually grind a good profile on this piece right here. So why am I making this? Well, the guy, can't find a replacement part. And so that's what we do a lot of times as machinists is we kind of manage to fill those gaps and figure out how to troubleshoot those problems that people cannot solve. Once again, I'm Derek Hogan at North Georgia Technical College. Let's sit back and see how this one goes. Okay, one of the first things I'm gonna have to do is get this roughly lined up with the center of my piece here. I want that by V groove to be on the top, so I can actually use that. Now another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rough off some of the sides of this, so that basically it ends up with being a 45 degree angle on both sides. So once I get those two things done, I'm gonna go about the crush dressing process on this and see if I can get it to actually take and form a good pattern. Now comes the fun part. Turn my machine on, and I'm gonna take my little dressing stick here and I'm going to do a rough 45 degree angle on this to almost a point. The angle on the splines are roughly right at 45 degrees. So that's gonna allow me to have it where it's just gonna make contact in the center of this piece right here. So that will allow me to crush the form till it fits down in the bottom of that groove, hopefully if this all works the way I envision this working. So let's turn the machine on and see what happens with this. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to come at this and I'm going to do one side I'm hold this at roughly a 45 degree angle
Okay, I've got to start on one side here. And now it's not perfect yet, but you can see the start of an angle on that one side. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side and just take this a little bit further. Now I'm going to do most of that off camera. So I'm just going to keep working this until I get that closer to a point. Not, maybe not quite a pure point, but close to a point. Okay, now what I'm doing is I have this roughly lined up in the center. I've got a 45, roughly 45 degree angle on both sides. I know it's not perfect. Uh, the crush dressing is going to take care of the rest of that. What I'm wanting to do is just clearance away material so that the crush dressing will work. So what I'm going to do is force this down into profile. So what I'm going to do is take and feed this down to it makes contact and roll it over to a certain point. We have a stop set. Once it hits a stop, I'll back it back out, mark my start and stop locations, rotate it around again and repeat the process all the way around the wheel. And if I do this right, I should get a usable profile that I can use to dress this and grind this with. Okay, where I'm at with this now is I did some rough dressing on this right here and some crush dressing on it. I'm going around making a roughing pass on these right here, I'm trying to remove a lot of the bulk of the material here to make it a little bit easier. I've tried several ways to do it and ultimately decided on something that's a little bit not the way I would have instant instantaneously thought. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it down here to a touch on the top of this right here. And once I touch there, I know where my zero is at. Zero, but my next zero here is going to be the one I'm going to go to. I'm holding that position right there. Locking down. Four thousand shy of my zero. Let it spark itself out. And now I'm going to start to move this very slowly across here. This is not the way I would have initially thought about doing this. But ultimately, this has been the best way I've found to do these. Off the edge, I'll feed down my rest of my remaining four thousandths. Come back in. Let's we'll spark a little bit here at the beginning. That's not the way I would have picked to do this. Now, the next thing I need to do here is move this around two revolutions plus four holes. So I'm gonna pull this out right here and rotate it around. Two four revolutions plus four holes in my bolt pattern here. And that will get me to where I need to go. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about the math involved with a dividing head. Um, Typically, every, well, every dividing head I've ever used has had a 40 to 1 ratio. Now, it's going to mean for every 40 turns of the crank handle right here, it's going to rotate the spindle one time. So, um, that's something you can use for math on this right here to set your um, spacing and all. So, what I would want to do here, let's just say I've got to cut... Oh, six divisions on a piece. So I'm making a hexagon or something like that. 
I can take my 40 and divide it by 6. So that's going to give me an answer here that will be 6 and 4 parts of 6 left over. Now, one thing I want to do, when you're doing the division here, I wrote this vertically here, but let me write this horizontally so you can see this better. I want to take 40 and divide it by 6. So 6 goes into this 6 times right here, which is 36. I have 4 left over. Now, traditionally, we would continue on with this right here, and we would work this out decimally. I don't need to do that. I need that 4 right here. So that's the number I need right here. So 4 6 is the fractional equivalence there. I got 4 parts of 6 left over. So what I would do next is come over to here my number plate. And I want to find a number plate that's divisible by 6. In the case of this one right here, 24, 6 to go into 24, 6 to go into 30, and well, that's enough right there to kind of work. I can work either 24 or 30 in this situation, so I could keep going with it if I needed to, but in that situation, I have two that will work for me. And I want to turn this 4 6 into an equivalency fraction. Okay, 4, well, 6 would go into 24, uh, four times. Four times four is 16. So I got 16 over 24 is an equivalency fraction. Now another one I've got there is six will go into um, 30 five times. Five times four is 20. So also 20 over 30 would be another one of there. So what I would want to do is pull that plunger out and rotate around six full turns and then 4 sixths of another turn, which would be either 16 holes on a 24 or 20 on a 30. Both of those would work in that situation. So with both of those working in that situation, I could use either one of those as a way to do this right here. Okay, so now that's using, using division. There's another way to do this right here. If I take 360 degrees and I divide it by 40, that's going to give me an answer of 9. So 9 will go into 360 uh, 40 times. So that means each revolution is 9 degrees. That's the other way I can solve this. Both divisions and um, degrees will work here. Now the difference is, what I want to do with degrees is I want to divide my degrees, let's just say 45 degrees, by my by 9, and that will tell me how many turns and how, what part of a turn I have. So in that case, 45 degrees would give me, you know, 5 full turns. 30 degrees divided by 9 would give me um, 3 full turns and 3 ninths of a turn. Okay, so... If I have a nine hole, which they don't make, that is basically every degree. If I have an 18 hole, that's 18 holes is going to be equal to 30 minutes or half a degree. If I keep going with this, I can work out what all these right here would have been. So 27 is 27 hole one, which I have on my, the one I made is going to be uh, 20 degrees, 20 minutes that is. A36 is one fourth of it, so it's going to be 15. Not seconds, minutes. Um, 15 minutes. And let's go with the 45 is um, 12. And the 54 is 10. So. That allows you to have the ability to space yourself out to different places there. Now, in case of our spline shaft, we have 18 splines on it. So I could work that out using either one of these and it would work. In this case, I actually worked it out using degrees here. So 360 divided by 18 gives me 2. 36 gives me zero there to 20. So 20 degrees per hole. 20 divided by 9 gives me 2 and 2 ninths of a turn. 
So that's why when I say I'm doing two full revolutions and four holes on an 18 plate. That's why I'm doing that, to space this out. The neat thing about a dividing head um, is they really are versatile when it comes to cutting gears and things that can get messy because, you know, whole degrees is not bad on a rotary table. Let's just say you're cutting a 39 tooth gear. So if I take 360, if I take 360 and I divide it by 39, things get really messy. Um, really messy really quick. So in that case, I want to go with using the divisions here. So I got 40 divided by 39, which gives me one turn and one 39th. And it will be absolute every time. So you just kind of keep moving around and keep track of where you're at. Now they make, let me pull the picture up on this front here. I didn't import this image first here. Let me pull this up here. They make, give me one second. There we go. They make these sector arms like you see right here and right here. And those arms allow you to space it out to basically keep yourself guided. I'm not able to run mine because I made a custom number plate and my sec my plunger here interferes with my sector arm. So I'm having to kind of keep track of it manually in that case. So that's where the map behind the dividing head is coming from. Okay, so what I'm doing now is going back and redoing the crust stress thing on this. I fed it down and I have it in my V groove. And what I'm going to do is line up these numbers I have, rotate it around, and you'll hear it physically crushing the profile of the wheel. I'll we'll stop each next, the next number gets to the bottom, back it out. Occasionally, I'll have to brush this out, rotate another number around to the bottom, bring it back in. Let's go over just a little bit of this one. continue the process all the way around. I'm going to do this one more one time on this right here, go around and grind these one more time, and then probably do this one last time, and that should get me, if you haven't grinded it, the two more times should give me a pretty good profile. The tricky thing about this is if I go to take it out to check it, I'm going to have to more than likely start kind of pretty much over. Um, so I'm trying to avoid that if, uh, if at all possible. So now I brought it, turned it back on. I brought it down to I lightly touched off in here in the, in the groove. You hear very little contact. So what I'm gonna do is go back around over here to my stop again. Let, let it grind. Let it grind. Let it grind. myself out, go back in, make sure I have the extra take off. We go right there. Back off the part. Now index around again. To index this around. It's a tight fit here. Once again I go around two turns and four pins. This is pretty snug on these pins. I made these pin holes just a tiny bit too small. So I've been having to use a screwdriver to kind of bump that out a little bit. Pull this out a little bit more. By the way, trying to do this stuff one-handed sometimes gets a little interesting. Lock in position. Now, I'm gonna go around two, two full turns. There's one turn out there. Here's my second turn. One, two, three, four holes. Put the pin in back in place. And I am good to go. Verify it's lined up. Grind another. 
Okay, so now I have made two passes around this, then done a roughing pass and another roughing pass. I'm about to do what I'm saying I call pre-finishing pass. As you can see, I haven't quite got down to where it's actually grinding all the way in the bottom yet here. So I'm going to one hand dress this again on the sides and then go about crush dressing. The numbers you see here are you I'm using for crush dressing this because I don't have the longest distance I can really travel and grind and shape this profile into the part here. So what I'm gonna do right now is go about once again, taking in my dressing stick and cleaning up these angles a little bit, get it more to a sharper point. And then basically gonna run the point down in here and crush the profile in the workpiece. Okay, now comes here either the moment I've been looking forward to or the moment I dread. Now, I can't take the footstock off without deactivating the magnet. If I deactivate the magnet, I lose alignment. So there's no way to check this on the grinder. So I have to do something I didn't really want to do. I have to remove this shaft from the dividing head to be able to, to check the alignment, check and see if it fits or not. I've done about three passes around. I've crushed stressed. I have indexed around different positions. Now, one little thing I'm going to do here before I go is I'm going to make a little mark on my jaw and a mark on my part. I'm going to line those up as close as I can to each other. I think you can possibly see those. There you go. And that will give me okay alignment. I'll still have to do a little bit of a manual alignment. I won't do another dressing on this wheel if I have to grind any more. But I'm hoping when I take this out that what I've ground so far is good enough for what we need. We'll find out in just a minute. And as you can see, it slides on where the factory slides were and stops still. So I still got a ways to go. So I'm going to go put this back on the grinder and start repeating the process. This will be what I'll have to do with this until ultimately I get it to work. It's going to be a matter of, you know, grinding some, taking it off, checking the fit, and then putting it back on and grinding some more. And, you know, eventually to get there. It has to eventually. It's just going to be a situation where it may take a little bit longer than I had hoped. Remember what I mentioned about aligning that mark? That's going to allow me to be close enough just to basically re-rough this out using the dressing stick and then go back in with the crush dress to get myself back located, uh, back in the groove. So I'm going to go back and repeat that process again. and. Grind about maybe two more passes around this thing and see what happens then. One of the things I'm having to do is reduce the outside diameter. I discovered there's a little point that it's making contact with. So I'm working on reducing the outside diameter on this 56 Rockwell C shaft. Without ceramic coins, because I don't have any in the shop right now. And a little bit of work on the lathe was what it needed. Turn down the outside diameter just a little bit in that area. And it now will slide fully on where it needs to go. So I am done on the dividing head and ready to move on to redoing this end of the shaft, which once again is gonna be a little bit of a challenge because once like like it is, this is a 56 Rockwell C shaft. So I'm having to work the work the Try to work it with some carbide tooling and hope for the best because I don't have any ceramic in here. And also, here's a trick with ceramic tooling, interrupted cuts like this are a nightmare. With carbide tooling, it's a nightmare also, but with ceramic, it's really a nightmare. So I'm trying to try to get the best I can and try to get the sand worked out on this. But overall, what I set out to do is done. Now, I am Derek Hogan. I am with North Georgia Technical College, working on a little video here for y'all for Project Machinist. Hey, if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to see, make sure to put it in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for your time. Hey, Derek, once again. I wanted to give you a little bonus coverage here. Uh, when I was turning this down, I didn't plan to originally show the uh, work on the end of the shaft here, but I wanted to show you just one little thing here. If you notice, there is a distinctive ring right here. The center of this shaft is soft. The 
outside where the splines are is hardened. So what this shaft has been, what's been done to this shaft is some type of, um, you know, case hardening, uh, could be in flame hardening, more than likely in dungeon hardening, which is only hardening the outside um, of it, leaving the inside of the shaft tough. Could also be a water hardening um, material, but I kind of doubt that in that situation. This is a little bit too uniform and also varies depending upon where I've been cutting. So that's, this is not consistent. So I think something was done to give this right here a um, harder outer shell. So this is something you can sometimes will see when you're working on something that is got threads on it, got splines on it, and it's a hardened work piece. Sometimes the actual center of the shaft is, is not bad. Which is good in this situation because I need to center drill this because I've got to still do the angle work on the other on this end right here, and that is right there is exactly as far as I can run it through the the machine without taking this bearing off, which I don't really want to do in this situation. Once again, I am Derek Hogan. I just thought I'd share that little extra bit with you here because I thought you all would appreciate seeing a little bit more of the process and seeing some of the things I ran into with it. Hope you uh, enjoy this and uh, thanks for your time.